Welcome to DCI platform, virtual learning. Today is 22nd of November, 2020, the Sunday afternoon at four o'clock. And we are back with a webinar on a different topic. So before we start our uh, webinar, there are some instructions to the attendees. And the instructions are, and the instructions are, At the time of registration, complete and proper details must be furnished. Since the same will be captured for generating certificate and CD points. No request, I repeat, no request for any change or modification in the details shall be considered. An e-certificate of attendance will be conferred to all the attendees, including undergraduate students, international attendees and non-dentists on their registered email. CD points will be awarded to the dentist registered with the State Dental Council Public Tribunals of India. Certificates will be sent to the attendees by email within three days of conclusion of each webinar who have attended the entire session of webinar uninterrupted. Please check out your junk mail folder just in case the certificate email got delivered there instead of your inbox. In case of any query or issue, please drop email at webinardci at gmail.com. Now for those who have missed the previous webinars or who, who are missing, who is missing this webinar also, we have an archives of all the webinars. You can log on to this www.dci dot go gov dot in slash webinar archive dot aspx the feedback link will be sent to you with the certificate email now in last 17 webinars we have had a very good overwhelming response to this webinar. And we also appreciate the highest attendance in the last webinar. The first one is the College Sardar Patel Postgraduate Institute of Dental and Medical Sciences, Uttar Pradesh. Second one is St. Joseph Dental College, Andhra Pradesh. Third one is Saraswati Dental College, Uttar Pradesh. Fourth one is Maharaja Ganga Singh Dental College, Rajasthan, and fifth one is Indraprastha Dental College, Uttar Pradesh. I must appreciate, I must appreciate the principal, the faculty members, and the students who have participated in this webinar. I also appreciate the participation of all of the colleges with their undergraduate and postgraduate students. Now today's seminar is on a biopsy and integral component of diagnostic diagnosis, treatment and prognosis of oral precancer and cancer. Good evening, friends. This festival of light is just over. All of us have celebrated this festival observing the necessary protocol. We have accepted this corona epidemic as a part of our life. Now we are back to our festival of knowledge the webinar. This festival is bringing lots of knowledge, information, and technical know-how in our lives. In the past, we have had various topics covered by experts as regards to dental caries, periodontal diseases, and malocclusion. There is one more important point to be pondered over, and that is oral precancer and cancer lesion. The affliction of oral cancer is increasing day by day due to various factors. The oral cancer can be controlled by identifying it at an early age stage, investigating the pathology, and planning the treatment accordingly. Today, we are going to discuss the importance of biopsy in diagnosis and monitoring the prognosis of oral <coughs> cancer. Dr. Ranjan Freshmi Paul, a senior pathologist, will elaborate on this topic. Dr. 
Ranjan Rashmipal is one of the senior most oral pathologists in the country. He is the professor emeritus from director research in the department of oral and dental sciences at JIS University, <coughs> Kolkata. He has a vast experience of teaching undergraduate and postgraduate students over 30 years. He has been guide for PhD students for the last 12 years. He is the first oral pathologist in the country to earn PhD degree in pathology from University of Calcutta and was awarded Ford's Medal by the University. He has a unique distinction of delivering both esteemed oration organized by Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists, a former president and the editor of the Journal of Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists. He was a member of Dental Council of India. He has been a secretary and president of the West Bengal State Branch of Indian Dental Association. He holds one US patent French. He has authored 70 research publications in international journals. It's a great pleasure to welcome and present Professor Ranjan Rashmi Paul. Before handing over the platform to Professor Paul, allow me to sincerely express my gratitude to Dr. Shetty, the President of Dental Council of India, Dr. Saha, the Honorary Secretary Dental Council of India, for initiating this wonderful project and giving us an opportunity to participate. I would like to thank Dr. Virendal Goyal, Mukesh Kumar, and all the technical staff who are making this webinar successful for us for last 17 times. My profuse thanks to all of them. Now may I invite Dr. R. R. Paul to deliver his lecture. Dr. Paul, over to you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Professor Bar Pandey for being so generous. Okay. Am I audible? Dr. Barpande, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Now, my sincere thanks goes to everybody around. I'm very thankful to Professor Barpande for his very generous introduction. I am knowing Dr. Bar Pandey for the last 40 years, he was the ex-professor head department of oral and maxillofacial pathology, government dental college Aurangabad. He is the ex-dean of the same very college. He is very nationally famous professor from academician in the field of oral pathology. Professor Bar Pandey had the honor to serve as the joint director dental government of Maharashtra. He is having dozens of publication in his credit. He has served our association in very many capacities, a pleasant personality and an outstanding academician come administrator. I am very thankful to him for being the moderator of today's webinar. Now to get back into my presentation today, biopsy an integral component of diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of oral precancer and cancer. Bio means life, obscene means vision. So biopsy means the vision of life. Of course, the definition goes, a surgical procedure to obtain a small piece of tissue from the living body for the purpose of diagnosis by microscopic examination. Ideally speaking, biopsy today serve the different field of learning, starting from macro, micro, and molecular vision. If you go back to one of the international the acclaimed association, American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, they have clearly stated that any abnormal tissue has to be submitted promptly for microscopic evaluation a dictum in day-to-day -day clinical practice. If you think of indications, yes, many of the clinicians think that there's no need to go for biopsy, I'll start the treatment. No, that's not the right way. In today's world, 
of evidence-based practice. We need to have the understanding of BioC clearly. The first indication pertaining to today's presentation is to rule out the pre-malignant and malignant disorders. Any persistent mucosal ulceration, uncertain etiology, also call for biopsy. Prolonged ulceration that are failing to respond to treatment also calls for biopsy in addition to other indications. When there are indications, there are contraindications also. And limitations too. When you are having any vascular lesion in the oral cavity, especially endometosis, having very high flow, they should be very careful in that. Any deep lesions in inaccessible areas that also need to be taken care of. Terminally ill patients, you should be careful in performing biopsy in terminally ill patients. Now, who are qualified to perform biopsy? A very debatable arena in the field of routine dental practice. The oral maxillofacial surgeons, they think we are the persons. Oral medicine people will think we are the persons. Oral pathologists will claim that, yes, we are the persons. But to tell you honestly, it is the dental surgeons. They are the right people who needs to be trained, taught to perform biopsy. If you look at the country in the third world, especially in our own country, a cancer-prone country, every dental surgeon, as they are trained and taught to take care of routine dental treatment, starting from intraalveolar extractions, to that of restorations, to that of prophylaxis and processes, the performance of biopsy in case of oral potentially malignant disorders and oral cancer should also be taught to them. To my mind, having about 40 years of active association as a professor in the field of dentistry, what I feel that every dental clinic in the country should act as the leaders and center for early confirmative diagnosis of OPMDs or oral precancerous lesions and conditions. In that case, the teaching and training to dental surgeons is of supreme importance. I would request our statutory bodies, especially Dental Council of India, to see to it that all our dental surgeons in that undergraduate process are being taught and trained to perform biopsy, at least to collect the specimen and send to the right laboratory for a further investigation and exclusion of malignancy. The importance. Somebody may think, what is the need to go for a biopsy? No, dear. Importance lies to avoid empirical treatment. We are not supposed to treat patients on just assume and treat. No, that's a wrong method. To avoid that, we need to go for biopsy and confirmation of diagnosis. We must know our limitations in clinical practice. Many a times, it may be or may not be in the purview of an individual to understand the pros and cons of the disease or ulcer concerned. In that case, the biopsy will be the helpful modality to think of a referral of that particular patient to the right individual. And of course, the confirmation of diagnosis, the outline of treatment, the treatment protocol to delineate, you need to go for a biopsy. And of course, for surgeons, especially our friends in the field of maxillofacial surgery, when you perform a surgery, to assess the cut margin, you need to go for a biopsy, and that becomes mandatory nowadays in relation to surgical treatment of head neck malignancy. The types of biopsy. Yes, there are many. Plus biopsy, incisional biopsy, excisional biopsy, biopsy of intraosseous lesions, lymph node biopsy, ultrasound guided and CT guided biopsy. It's up to the clinician or the dental surgeons or the specialist to decide which biopsy procedure should be the ideal for that particular individual patient. Trust biopsy, a routine procedure. It's not a conclusive procedure, but it's a very procedure, very helpful for screening. Every clinic, what I feel, should have that procedure 
for any dental surgeon practicing in a dental clinical setup. You use a brush and rotate that brush in your diagonal site and collect the tissue or the cells even up to the basal layer. If you rotate the brush and if you find a bit of bleeding, if you encounter that, you are reached, you have reached to the basal layer, collect the cells, spread it over a slide, fix it, stain it, and send it to your own pathology friend, who will be competent to find out the cellular changes, the nuclear changes, and let you know immediately that what is the status of the disease process. So cross biopsy is one of the very informative and screening process, but not confirmatory. The needle biopsy. When you are having a space occupying lesion, clinically you are unable to find, then obviously you have to put a needle to find some aspirate from the lesion or the lesion which is space occupying in nature. And here you can use a cutting biopsy using a 14 gauge true cut needle, a 10 ml syringe with 20 gauge needle also very helpful. You need not collect enough of fluid or the tissue. Few drops of blood or tissue fluid containing the tiny bits of tumor tissue is enough for diagnosis. The needle biopsy should be performed preferably by oral and maxillofacial surgeons who are very, very versed about the head neck anatomy. Incisional biopsy, very common procedure. Any dental surgeon can perform that incisional biopsy. You have to select the site. You have to identify the nature of lesion. And you have to use a very simple, what you call scalpel, 15 number blade is enough. Or you can use a punch also to collect the tissue and preserve the tissue in a right preservative and send it to your oral pathology friend for further evaluation and diagnosis. Excisional biopsy, many a times. It is your clinical judgment that will spell whether you will go for incisional biopsy or excisional biopsy. If you think that excision will serve as the purpose of treatment, it can be effectively used as a modality of treatment in that particular patient, you can think of excisional biopsy. You excise the tissue or the mass or the lump as you feel, make sure the tissue or the lump is what you call tagged properly. That's a mistake being made many a times. Tagging is very important for your oral pathology frame because it's a teamwork. You have to give the real indications and information to your oral pathology frame who will be able to make out and will be able to make section out of the different margins of the lesion. And if possible, you can send a diagram to your oral pathology frame. Progen section is another important arena. Frozen section biopsy is usually used for operatively. Today, the maxillofacial oncosurgery has reached to a newer dimension. Vis a vis oral and maxillofacial pathology has also reached in molecular level. Now, when you operate on a patient, again, you decide the cut margin. The clinical acumen of the surgeon is important, undoubtedly, but to be very sure, a frozen section evaluation will be of immense importance. And it is used accordingly during surgery, mainly to assess the margin of the resected tissue of the residual tumor. A frozen section should be taken from the host tissue edge rather from the specimen tissue edge. So don't make that mistake. Always you go for the host tissue edge, which will give you the right indication whether the tissue have been, entire tumor tissue has been taken out surgically or not. Many a times if you go for a jaw resection, where the curatings from the narrow spaces can be used as a frozen section. Here some additional measures need to be taken because the fibro fatty mass from taken being taken from the center of the jaw lesion can jolly will be processed and can go for a tissue section preparation. If it is greedy otherwise, in a properly examined by the surgeon, he should give that noting to the pathologist that tissue is gritty in nature so that he can take or she can take care of the microtome life. 
specimen such taken should be immediately snap frozen at minus 70 degrees centigrade centigrade on a solid carbon dioxide or liquid nitrogen for proper evaluation clip not by oxygen yes many times we may not be able to clinically find the lesion within the oral cavity or around the oral cavity but there are nodes the node enlargement clinically palpable node when you are not sure about the nature of the lesion we are unable to diagnose the lesion then you can put a needle or you can think of excisional biopsy of node in that case we should remember that cervical lymph nodes are the drainage pathway of all oral malignancies and should be excised without entering the node with the capsule intact because if you tear the capsule there is a possibility of seeding of the tumor cells in around the left side tissue mass now after the biopsy is performed you need to send the specimen to your oral pathology friend just don't send it please you make sure you take confident of your patient oral pathology friend he should be given all information pertaining to the clinical pathological aspect of the patient the patient's demographic aspect the radiographic imaging details if not the other informations the intra operative observations of the surgeon here the clinical acumen or surgical acumen of the surgeon concerned may be of immense value to the pathologist to decide and think of channelization of the proper diagnosis obviously the date and number of previous biopsies can be of additional help informed consent yes today we are accountable today we are answerable when it comes to question of biopsy when it comes to the question of diagnosis and treatment of our pre cancer and cancer you are answerable so you need to take your this is i saying that medicine as such is an art and science it's art first science later so you have got to take your patient in confidence don't fight in your patient about biopsy the myth biopsy means cancer we all know the professional we know that it is wrong but it is there in the mind of your patient so you need to explain that in a very decent way you need to take your patient in confidence you need to take the from consent from your patient before you proceed for biopsy or any surgical treatment or so ever regarding informed consent our friend professor george paul has given a nice webinar few weeks back and i'm sure most of you have heard him and have earned the knowledge necessary that what is the importance of informed consent and necessity in clinical practice now the types of anesthesia yes you need to go for a biopsy you need to go for a biopsy in doing a biopsy you need to go for anesthesia it is your clinical judgment whether you want to go for a local anesthesia or the patient situation or the condition demands general anesthesia normally intraoral lesions in accessible areas or the mucosal lesions all requires local anesthesia we can think of a nerve block you can think of a field block many times infiltration anesthesia is used but make sure it is given as far a distance site as possible because in local anesthesia the local anesthetic solution or the agent may be absorbed by the tissue or the cells and the architectural change will be induced or cellular morphology will change and will come in the diagnostic procedure when the lesion is in an area say it is the base of the tongue or in the posterior part of the floor of the mouth you need to go for a general anesthesia in that case it is the purview of the oral and maxillofacial surgeon and not the purview of an oral pathologist or dental surgeon here you should call your oral maxillofacial surgeon friend who will prefer a sort of mesotracheal intubation 
and go for biopsy from base of the tongue or from posterior part of the floor of the mouth. Yes, the macroscopic guideline. Yes. When you were in the clinics, we are examining a patient having oral lesions. The patient is having ulcerative lesions. The ulcer is not healing. The erythema is persistent in nature. The nodular or granular surface is there. The indurated region is there. The color change is deepening. All these are indications to select the site. But let me tell you, in spite of all these features, which are indicative of selection of site or guideline of selection of biopsy site, your clinical acumen and patient's information is of supreme importance because the disease has got its own language. A disease cannot talk, but disease emits information to the clinician through its clinical pathological presentation. And all clinicians or surgeons or physicians should have that ability to understand that language of the disease process. When you examine the lesion, when you hear your patient patiently, you hear your patient patiently, they will tell you the diagnosis. That's a dictum in clinical practice. A clinician finger is to act as a sensor. You touch the lesion, you know what you are touching, whether you are examining a normal mucosa or you are examining a nodular surface or you are in relation to a nodular region or integrated region. Accordingly, you collect all this information, your clinical acumen put together and think of the right site. The incisional biopsy, as I have already told you, many a times may not be that easy. Many a times you, are, you may be in a fix, but the lesion is not emitting the picture that can be clinically diagnosed. In that case, yes, there are modalities, what you call the dental surgeon can practice that, all that, the lesion that you're having, here in this case, we're having a lesion in the right lateral border and ventral surface of the tongue. You paint that area with 1% aqueous toluidin blue and wait for one minute. You decolorize that with 1% acetic acid. The region which will retain the toluidin blue staining, that's the right site. We all know toluidin blue is a metachromatic dye of thiazine group. And it will be binding to DNA because the nucleic acid content is very high in case of pre-malignancy and malignancy. And the toluidin blue acid is very specific and very sensitive. And knowing fully well, it doesn't have any mutagenic or carcinogenic effect. This toluidin blue acid as screening and incisional biopsy thereof is very, very helpful in case of PVL, what you talk in terms of proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. There, you will go for multiple biopsies, which is clinically sometimes is termed as geographic biopsies. Because when the lesion is very extensive, involving multiple sites of the root cavity, then you are in a fix, which will be the right site of biopsy. In that case, you go for toluidine blue acid. Handling of a biopsy specimen very important arena of performing biopsy. We know and we have seen many a times we are the culprit. We take the biopsy, keep it aside. You proceed with your team for surgical procedure and you neglect the biopsy specimen. Very condemnable, condemnable approach because the tissue will undergo biopsy specimen. It's not desirable. Any crashing of the biopsy specimen is not also desirable. Any tearing also is not desirable. When you cut, you always go for a short cut. Try to be very precise in performing a biopsy. For biopsy, there is a dictum. The dictum is it should be appropriate and it should be adequate. Appropriate and adequate biopsy is always rewarding in clinical diagnosis and treatment arena. And it's up to the acumen of the surgeon or oral pathologist or the dental surgeon to decide. 
or two leashes. Yes, if you keep the specimen beyond five minutes, there is a possibility possibility of auto leashes. What I would add to this is that any biopsy specimen which is having inadequate quantum of fibrous connective tissue around that undergoes auto leashes quicker. Say, for example, limb node biopsy. See, in that case. earlier it is better preferably before 5 minutes once you take the biopsy out of the human body make sure it is being fixed and the right fixity ways what you call 10% buffered formalin and the volume how do you decide it is preferably 20 times of the volume of the biopsy specimen and duration of fixation is another important part where you can think of approximately 24 hours no we have to decide about the lesions why are you advise my option in that case the common oral potentially malignant disorders are commonly known as precancerous lesions and or conditions are very important within the oral cavity we have important oral mucosal lesions having malignant potentiality that includes is known to all of you is erythroplakia leukoplakia subcutaneous fibrosis and oral lichen planus especially the erosive type the common cancer in the oral cavity is undoubtedly squamous cell carcinoma and needs no mention about it the macroscopic features yes the macroscopic acumen will be very rewarding in the process of biopsy if not in the process of treatment in leukoplakia a big lesion what you have to look for you have to look for a thin or thick or white lesion the surface may be granular or nodular may be fissured or verrucous or reddish or erythematous the borders may be elevated the surface may be leathery in palpation in proliferative verrucous leukoplakia which is slowly spreading a lesion having roughened verrucous surface and it's a clinical acumen of you as it is being pointed out in all these four clinical pictures the first one is showing a reddish patch on a white lesion the second one showing a granular area third one is showing a reddish erythematous area surrounded by a white patch and on the tongue you are getting another reddish patch on a diffuse white lesion so these are the lesions these are the sites of the lesions which are demanding a sort of biopsy and can give us the information about the nature of the lesion in case of erythroplakia which is an erythematous lesion interposed with focal white flux which is usually well demarcated in its margin usually soft and velvety texture here we know out of our clinical experience that almost all erythroplakias are frank or what do you call invasive squamous cell carcinoma but before starting the treatment we must go for a biopsy and you should select the site having that same granular or nodular features and you should go for incisional biopsy either with a punch or scalpel subcutaneous fibrosis a very hospitalized disease history is all is there with chewing of betel nut and allied tobacco products it's a disease prevalent in south east asian countries the disease is manifested with varying degrees of crispness there is a pale and diffuse whitish mucosa the form and cause present with fibrotic bands that's all very simple diagnosis clinically is not that important but patchy ulcerations deepening of pigmentations as is shown in this picture on the left sick he calls for biopsy because we know histologically subcutaneous fibrosis under microscope may reveal dysplasia may not reveal dysplasia So we are scared about dysplastic lesion. It has been proved in clinical practice that dysplastic changes 
may occur in a pre-existing cervical fibrosis even after years. So we should be very careful to go for periodic evaluation clinically and to think for biopsy if it calls for. Erosive lichen planus. Yes, it's another lesion, potentially malignant one, and which will have that erosive lesion, pain and bleeding on palpation, erythematous white pseudomembranous ulcerated lesion, and usually bordered by the faintest whitish stria. Here you take a biopsy, as in this case, see the just posterior part of the cheek in this patient on the right side of the cheek, or the mental surface of the tongue. That clinically you should judge, that clinical acumen of years will give you the clue which is the right site for biopsy. Pearl cancer is comparatively easy, but the white thick areas better to avoid. When you get an ulcerated lesion here, you go for the biopsy from the lesion proper, including a bit of the age. Where there is a sort of lesion in the third slide, you can make out the tongue, but the tongue is fixed in the floor of the mouth. There you should prefer a site which is showing induration and persistent ulceration. There in the palate, another lesion, where I have given the indication which is the right site. You know, before you get into examination of the patient, you ask a very simple question to your patient, where the ulcer started? The patient, if possible, and if is able to point out the site where the lesion first started, and if that area is accessible, that area will give you the right picture under my microscope, and that will be a clue for selecting the site. In addition to that, the nodular fissured surface or inundated borders or the ulcerated areas are indicative of biopsy site. Now from the arena of macroscopic evaluation, we'll get into the microscopic field. Friends, the microscopic field is a vast area. But remember, a good quantum of knowledge, a domain knowledge in macroscopic field, a novel knowledge from the clinical field is of enormous importance to get and navigate through the microscopic process. If you are unable to gather the clinical information properly, please get back to your patient because the macroscopic information, the detailed information will help us to pave into the process of microscopic evaluation. When you think of microscopic evaluation of OPMDs or oral potentially malignant disorders or precancer, what you call colloquial way. The cardinal light microscopic features are characterized by two things. One is architectural changes, other is the cellular changes. Now, when you take a biopsy, process the tissue in the laboratory, prepare the section, stain that usually by hematoxyl eosine, and you get a slide under microscope you try to look for the architectural change. The innocuous appearance, as in the upper slide, left side, you get the normal oral epithelium gradually to OPMDs, to dysplasia, to carcinoma in situ, to stomach cell carcinoma. You see the angry appearance, the disfigurement of the overlying epithelium. That we talk about the architectural change, and that gives a clue the overall clue of the tissue concern. Once you get that overall tissue concerned information, we get into the cellular changes. Yes, that is very, very important. And the oral pathology frames of ours should have that microscopic acumen, the depth of, depth of knowledge to understand what all we are meant and designed and designated to look for. Here we should look for the changes like prominent nuclei, like hyperchromatia, like nuclear pleomorphism, like nuclear cytoplasmic altered ratio, like increased mitosis, like abnormal mitosis, like multinucleation. Yes, in this light of yours, you may get all changes positive, you may get few of the changes positive. 
but your microscopy acumen in this respect will be the guideline to diagnose the character of the lesion and to decide where you stand with your patient. Now, obviously, the question comes about gradation of dysplasia. Yes, in normal to abnormal and to that of mild dysplasia to moderate dysplasia to severe dysplasia in our routine clinical practice or practice of microscopic pathology, we talk about mild dysplasia. That means when the already mentioned dysplastic features that cellular changes and or architectural changes are limited to the basal and or immediate superbasal layer, we talk in terms of mild dysplasia. And when that changes are seen in the slide, extended up to the mid of the thickness, you think in terms of moderate dysplasia. And when the changes are perceptible from the basal to the uppermost layer, we talk in terms of severe dysplasia. Yes, that's the ideal assessment or what you call the qualitative assessment of a slide from a premalignant lesion under a microscope. And we talk, we pathologists, we talk about mild epithelial dysplasia, we talk about moderate epithelial dysplasia, we talk about severe epithelial dysplasia. I agree, there are a lot of difference of opinion regarding this and this clinical, diagnostic and prognostic implications. There are different groups of opinion, right? Knowing fully well, none of the opinion are always 100% rewarding. The WHO concept is well regarded across the globe and we think of that gradation should go for mild to moderate to severe epithelial dysplasia. So for the qualitative assessment is concerned and when you get a patient showing moderate or severe epithelial dysplasia, we think that we should immediately intervene so far the treatment part is concerned. But today's molecular profile has given up a better weapon to assess the prognosis and our behavioral pattern of the lesion concern. Now, there is a lot of differences about the groups of oral pathologies regarding the qualitative assessment. And uh, parallelly, we are having a semi-quantitative approach. And in our group, on research group in Calcutta, we have contacted to assess the malignant potentiality index through semi-quantitative method. And we have come out with very impressive results and we are having a publication as seen in this particular slide. With this concept of macroscopic and microscopic field, we should get into the molecular concept. Now, molecular concept is in relation to the fields of genetics and epigenetics. We know genes. Yes, everybody talks about, even the lay person, they talk about genes. Today, we define malignancy or cancer as a disease in genes that encodes protein. The disease in genes that encodes protein. That means gene encodes protein. That controls cell cycle cell survival, cell motility, and angiogenesis. So there are different types of genes responsible for genesis of cancer. Primarily, the genetic mutations plays a supreme role in development of cancer, as you know, as on date. Now, the proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes are very important. In human being, we are having about 70 genes showing what we call germline mutations, whereas about 342 genes are showing what you call somatic mutations. And that genetic mutation plays a real importance in development of cancer or carcinogenesis. Amongst all the genes, the tumor suppressor gene that is P53 and its family member P63 are very important. In this busy slide, you can make out from normal to gradual transformation to cancer on the right side, that is normal epithelium to dysplastic epithelium to squamous cell carcinoma 
the gene expression complex changes, and accordingly, we decide about the genetic profile of the individual, and we think of the treatment and prognostic part. One of the important part in gene and in relation to head neck cancer is HPV, that is human papilloma virus. Yes, we are blaming tobacco. We are blaming alcohol over the years. In somewhere in 2000, the role of HPV in relation to head neck cancer have been accepted. There are about 200 different strains of HPV viruses, of which HPV 16, mostly, to some extent, HPV 18 is responsible for the oral cancer or oropharyngeal cancer precisely. The human papilloma viruses, they get into the epithelial cell that is within the keratinocyte. They will attack the human, I mean, the cellular genome. They will help the up expression or overexpression of E6 and E7 protein, and we know that E6 and E7, E6 will cause suppression of P53, whereas E7 will cause suppression of PRB protein, and suppression of P53 being a tumor suppressor gene, the patient, the cells concerned in the patient will experience a sort of genetic mutations undergo multiplications, aberrant proliferation, and turns into malignancy. The particular slide is showing how that inhibition of E2 gets into the process of E6 and E7 inhibition in relation to HPV 16 that I have already narrated. We have conducted our research here again through our research group in Calcutta, in collaboration with IIT Kharagpur and Guru Nanak Institute of Dental Science and Research. And we have come out our publication as seen in this particular case that ECAD as well as P53 and mitotic fibers, how they are related, especially in relation to one of the precancerous or pre-malignant lesion that is oral cervical fibrosis. Now epigenetics. We know epigenetics is playing another important role. Epigenetics, you know, these are changes in the gene expression, heritable changes, reversible changes. The epigenetic changes will narrate itself in terms of very many mechanisms. We get LOH, that is what you call hetero zygosity, loss of heterozygosity. We have got DNA methylation. We have got histone modification. We have got miRNA alterations. That LOH or loss of heterozygosity or DNA methylation or histone modification or even miRNA alterations are playing a pivotal role in epigenetics. Nowadays, the researchers or the scientists, especially our geneticist friends, they're playing, paying more importance to epigenetic changes compared to genetic changes. We have also conducted through our research group that changes in epigenetic level and this is one of the publication in relation to that in gingivobacal cancer. And this publication has come into citation in an oral cancer book recently published from USA, from our group. This is another one on miRNA and performed in Calcutta in collaboration with IIT through our research group. And we have found that epigenetic mechanism is playing a very, very vital role in relation to the development of artificial malignancy or head neck cancer. Yes, friends, the geneticists, specialists in the cancer biology, they are there to help us. 
But as soon as when a patient drops into your clinic, you cannot just tell him the story of genetics. You have got to give him the relief. You have got to accept the patients and treat the patient. So what should be our modalities? As on day, leaving aside the genetic modalities that is in future, as on day, the recommended diagnosis, treatment and management protocol for OPM days. What I feel that a patient clinically diagnosed as OPM days. Clinically diagnosed means diagnosed as per the subjective and objective features. The subjective features are very, very important. Again, I would repeat that at the zero level, you hear your patients patiently, they'll tell you the diagnosis. The objective features, it's your clinical acumen. You be a good observer. You have to develop your finger to touch the lesion and find out and record the objective features. And if your subjective and objective features spells that yes, it could be a precancerous or pre-malignant or potentially malignant lesion or a malignant lesion as you feel, the first thing that you should do, stoppage of all oral deleterious habits, removal of all mechanical, chemical irritations. Don't jump on the treatment. First stop all this, eradicate all this. Then go for routine hemogram, especially the hemoglobin percentage to assess the patient is suffering from anemia or not, especially the Indian omen and blood sugar, which will invite a lot of oral microbial infections. Now improve the oral health. Next, through oral prophylaxis, follow to be followed by regular home care. Instruction should be given to your patient. Treat if there is a prevailing candidiasis. Institute the treatment of diabetes mellitus if it is there with your medicine friend. Try to correct anemia and nutritional deficiency in consultation with your medicine friend if present. In doing so, you may have to lapse out seven to 10 days time. Doesn't matter. You again reevaluate clinically. At the end of 10 to 12 days, after going through all this screening process, evaluation process, you will see that most of the cases will lose their angry appearance. Even if thereafter the lesion persists, Yes, if it is not responding or if it is responding. If after this the lesion responds, go for a close periodic review. Yes, don't say, the, say goodbye to your patient. If the lesion after with all these preventive basic measures in your clinical setup is not responding, you think of a biopsy. And you think of biopsy whether to go for incisional biopsy or to go for excisional biopsy. And after doing a biopsy, if you get dysplastic lesion, you may have no dysplasia, you may have malignancy. All three possibilities are there. When you get dysplastic lesion, you have to take the course that I have narrated here. It may be mild, moderate, or severe. If it is moderate and severe, you go for surgical excision. And go for serious evaluation, serial section evaluation in case of moderate and severe one. If it is malignancy, obviously you have to go for confirmation of your diagnosis through biopsy and refer the patient to a tumor board. It is not an individual decision. It is not to be decided by a surgeon alone, not to be decided by a radiotherapist alone. It should be it should also not be decided by oral pathologist. It's a tumor board that they will decide and think of modalities of treatment. And after institution of surgical or radiotherapy treatment or rehabilitation, you must put this group of patients, both dysplastic and malignant patients, on periodic review clinical. Where there is no dysplasia, you can think of other lesions that you should be very careful, but you can call the patient back after few months again for checkup. Now the future. The science is progressing. Oral health science is progressing. And gradually we are getting into the field of genomics. Cancer genomics or cancer biology is giving us a lot of weapons in relation to genetics and epigenetics. And on the basis of that, we are going to 
land into the era of personalized therapy in the near future. And the treatment of all individuals suffering from head neck cancer will be tailored because head neck cancer or maxillofacial region cancer is heterogeneous in nature. Although these are basically derived from the surface mucosa being composed especially of epithelial cells, it should have been homogeneous, but no, the head neck cancer or oropharyngeal cancer is basically heterogeneous in nature. And that heterogeneity of that cancer and pre-malignancy is putting us in real trouble to find out the real answer in future. And I'm confident that the research which is going on across the globe in near future will be able to find an answer to all this with the genetic quantum of knowledge and to tailor the treatment for specific individual. These are my references. Now, before I conclude, I must pay my salute to our Honorable President, Professor Seti, to our very dear Secretary, Professor Shah, Professor Miranda Goyal, Mr. Mukeshji, Deputy Secretary, Dental Council of India, an entire technical team, those who are working round the clock to make this webinar successful and send the academic message, the clinical message, and update entire dental professional crowds across the country and overseas to take up and meet the challenge of the oral and dental diseases in this part of the country. I'm failing, I'll be failing in my duty if I do not pay my appreciation to my colleagues in the Department of Oral Pathology at Guru Nanak Institute of Dental Science, the PhD scholars at JS University, and the postgraduate students, those who have really helped me to be with you and to go for this presentation. I really, really thank the young stars, those who are the future of the country and the profession. we come to the question and answer series. Friends, I must tell you that I have received a number of questions uh, from the dental students, undergraduate students, postgraduate, as well as the dental professionals. It was very tough for me to select the questions related to this. Now, uh, here are some questions I'd like to present to Dr. Paul. These are the questions, sir. The first question is, um, what is the scope of performing biopsy in community and outreach state settings? Which method is appropriate for the same? What transport medium do you recommend? Yeah, it's a very good question for clinical practice outside the, you know, updated setup. And I believe this will help our dental surgeon colleagues, could you clinically suspect that the patient is suffering from polymanicular lesion? And if you are really unable to select a site, because for that you need a quantum of clinical experience. In that case, very simple, you go for uh, application of uh, toluidine blue and select the site and perform a biopsy if it is in accessible area through local anesthesia. And uh, you see to it that you use the scalpel blade, more simply the punch, five millimeter punch, and it should be of adequate size and of depth. It should not be that to include only epithelium. You see to it that it is of sufficient depth to get into the muscle layer and uh, fix it in a preservative that is 10% buffered formalin and send it to your friend nearby, oral pathology friend with the details, demography, and clinical pathological information of the patient concern. Now, in a village setup, in a remote setup, it may not always be possible to get an oral pathologist. In that case, do very simple thing. Send this specimen, as I have told you, to fix it a 
formalin fix a specific medium and send it to a general pathology lab, ask the pathologist to prepare a section, stain back to smartoxin eosin, send the slide to your old pathology friend. She will be able to give you the right guideline about the microscopic status of the disease and on that basis, on the basis of the microscopic and uh, macroscopic observation. Because, see, the microscopy is not only to give you the answer. Whatever feedback you get from your oral pathology frame, make sure you go back to bed again. Because the flow is from bed to bed, back to bed. And clinically, you corroborate. And when you think that, yes, the information, microscopic information is up to the mark, you go for institutional treatment. Thank you. Now, another question is, is it true that the biopsy, biopsy speed up the progression and the speed of spread of malignant lesion? Yeah. This is a question given by my friends. But I, I think this is a question being asked by the patients and community, common community also. Many times the patients thinking that, yes, I'm having a malignancy as told and narrated by my doctor. I won't go for a biopsy because if a biopsy is done, it will spread and I'll die. That's a myth. You know, when you, if you properly biopsy is performed properly without much of laceration, a sharp cut biopsy is always beneficial and rewarding. The concept of metastasis is not that simple. It's a very complex biological process. Now, when you perform a biopsy in a malignant lesion, the malignant cell for metastasis must have to get yourself itself dissociated from the mother mass. And that dissociation is guided by one of the important factors is EMT, what you call epithelio-mesenchymal transition. The tumor cell must get dissociated from the mother mass and must have to get into the surrounding connective tissue stoma. From here, again, you have got to survive in the stomal area. Then you have to, it have to get into the bloodstream or in the lymphatic stream, where it will face another obstacle by the body immune mechanism and the, what you call the killer cells there. And it has to be carried out in resistance site. The tumor cell needs a margination to the vessel wall. It must have to come out of the vessel wall through what you call endothelial lining and come out there in the connective tissue in that vicinity. You have got to go for a niche preparation and proliferation. So you know it's a very complex process. It's not that simple. And it's very unlikely that if a biopsy is properly done, it will cause metastasis. But experimental pathology have revealed that by injecting a tumor cell into the bloodstream in hamsters have revealed that there is a possibility of distant metastasis only in 0.01% of the cases. Very, very negligible. So, a properly trained clinician, be it a dental surgeon or oral pathologist or oral surgeon performing a biopsy, very, very unlikely it will cause a distant metastasis. And the last part is you'll have to do a biopsy because until unless you confirm the diagnosis, you cannot institute the treatment because treatment cannot be done on the presumption or assumption. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question is, is frozen section evaluation essential for all oncosurgical procedures? Well, the answer is yes. See, uh, today our uh, maxillofacial surgeons are performing a commendable job. Yes, I salute them. They are performing a commendable job compared to what is being done before 30, 40 years. Now, kidney concussion surgery 
you perform the surgical procedure, you reach to the cut margin on the basis of clinical, radiological, or CT or MRI or PET CT, whatever the preoperative procedure you perform. But still, the microscopic invasion in the surrounding tissue should be ruled out. And to assess that cut margin, it is always recommended that we should go for frozen section evaluation for operatively. And for the frozen section evaluation is the oncosurgeon or the oral and maxillary facial surgeon should be in continuous touch with his oral and maxillary facial pathology frame. The lab should be nearby so that or in the same under the same roof, you know, when you are surgery, performing a surgery, as I have already told you in my presentation, you collect the tissue from the host margin, not from the resected margin of the specimen, and send it to your pathology. She will tell you whether you are playing safe or not. And for that, even if you feel that you have resected a part of mandible, where there is a possibility of intraosseous invasion, you can go for a snap preparation and you get the answer immediately from your oral pathology friend. And for snap preparation, you just touch the slide. Don't rotate the specimen over the slide. Just touch it, send it to your next door no oral pathology lab or general pathology lab or oncopathology lab, as the case may, maybe they'll give you the answer. And it's essential, it's very, very essential to play safe. Yeah. And another question is, should toluidine glue procedure to be followed for all the patients? Uh, no, not for all the patients. Whenever the clinician is in a doubt, see, the clinical acumen quantum varies. Experienced clinicians, experienced dental surgeons, experienced oral pathologists, experienced oral maxillofacial specialists, surgeons, or the OMR specialist, they can assess the lesion clinically. But for a beginner to start with, or those who are not having that updated concept or quantum of knowledge, for them, yes, solid in blue is advocated. One more thing that where the lesion is involving a wide area, where in the first sitting you cannot think of excision of the entire lesion, but you want to know the nature of the lesion, the nature of Harris, some are it is thick, some are it is thin, some are it is erythematous, some are it is white, some are it is fissured, some are it is nodular, like that, you know, varied picture is being depicted by the lesion. In that case, the clinician is in a fix that what should be the right site or sites for biopsy. In that case, yes, you go for toluidine blue assay, take multiple biopsies, what you call in terms of geographic biopsies, and you situate that that biopsy specimen is assessed, and if you get dysplastic changes, the as I have told you, the biopsy should be marked properly, and the history should be given to your pathology friend so he can tell you or she can tell you which site is showing malignant changes and what is the status of the lesion in terms of dysplasia, and accordingly you can plan your treatment. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what is the best tissue preservative? Yes. Now, you know, over the last 45 years, being in active teaching and in active clinical practice, I have seen, I don't want to blame anybody, but I have seen many times the specimen is just left aside. The surgical procedure is going on, specimen is left aside on a piece of gauze, and after an hour or two or three, in the day's end, the specimen is preserved and sent. That's wrong. It should be preserved within five minutes, as I said. The preservation should not, many a times it is done in formal saline, what you call, sorry, normal saline. No. You can, if you don't have the best preservative is 10% buffered formalin. And 10% buffer formalin fixative specimens is fine enough even for routine histological procedure, even for immunohistochemistry. If it is properly fixed, yes, paraffin fixed sections, 
you know, that will give you the real help for human histochemistry. If you don't have available of 10% buffered formalin, 95% ethyl alcohol will suffice, but try to transfer it to 10% buffered formalin as early as possible and try to fix in a reasonable duration at least for 24 hours and send it to your pathology friend to take care of the specimen. Uh, the next question is, how HPV infection is important for development of oral cancer? Yes, that's a very, very interesting question. As on date, see, oral cavity, where infection is very, very predominant, starting from non-specific infection to very specific infection. Today, the research has informed us that in head neck cancer, not precisely in oral cancer, but especially in oropharyngeal cancer or cancer in hypopharynx or in the oropharynx or in the tonsillar region, they are found to be associated with HPV, that is human papilloma virus. Earlier days, this human papilloma virus has been reported to be associated with cervical cancer. In today's world, it has been seen that HPV infection relating to oropharyngeal cancer have surpassed the ovarian cancer relating to HPV association. HPV was reported to be associated with oropharyngeal cancer somewhere in 2000. There are approximately 200 different types of HPV viruses, of which HPV-16 is very important. Now, this HPV-16 virus, you know, they will get into the keratinocyte. And within the keratinocyte, they will target the E2 protein. E2 protein happens to be very important pertaining to the role of E6 and E7 protein. E6 protein acts as a suppressor for P53 gene. E7 protein acts as a suppressor for PRB protein. Now this E2 protein over expiration results in, sorry, E2 protein, you know, when it is being attacked by the HPV, the up expression, upward expression of E7 and E6 happens. And that E6 protein causes suppression of P53, that is the tumor suppressor gene. And the moment P53 suppression occurs, we know that P53 is a very, very important gene or oncogene, which is called sometimes as Kurdian gene. And that P53, you know, what you call down regulation or suppression of P53 expression will allow the cell to multiply because P53 is very essential for genomic stability. And that stability, including DNA regulation, etc., that is being altered. So the cell will undergo proliferation, aberrant multiplication, and there will be development of malignancy. And it has been seen that the P53 down regulation is seen in earlier carcinogenesis in relation to head neck cancer. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul. We are racing with time. Thank you, dear. We are uh, now um, cutting down the questions. Now, before I, I close, I want to uh, give you another uh, information. Like in last webinar, we had a very overwhelming response uh, where uh, Q colleges um, had participated in highest numbers. I told you, Sardar Patel, postgraduate, Institute of Dental and Medical Sciences, Uttar Pradesh, St. Joseph Dental College, Andhra Pradesh, Saraswati Dental College, Uttar Pradesh, Maharaja Ganga Singh Dental College, 
Rajasthan and Indraprastha Dental College, Uttar Pradesh. Now I would like to congratulate all these uh, colleges and the faculty members and the principals. But I would also like to see some more new names coming up in this um, in in this series. Now next is we are going to have. Um, a seminar uh, the time and the date will be informed to you later on but the topic is so interesting approaching trauma victims and the golden hour management for our oral maxillofacial surgery speciality and this is presented by none other than the senior most uh, uh, oral surgeon in the country professor shada mohammed a badmashri awardee an equally uh, senior person, Dr. Amit Kumar Roy, is going to moderate this session. So please watch out for the date and the time. Till then, au revoir. Thank you so much, Dental Council of India, and thank you so much, all of you, for spending su such a wonderful evening with us. Thank you so much.